I think this is a very important conference. So I thank you all for attending and also the people who have organised the, the event, sort of three days of uh, incredible kind of food discussions. But in those discussions, I think a key question is, and this is a very long sentence, so I might have to draw breath in the middle of it, um, <laughs> is whether humans as a species can respond logically to our intellectual understanding of the world's limitations and thus overcome flaws in our ancient DNA, or whether our primitive urges towards procreation, tribalism and power will prevail and will behave like all the other plague species and suffer a truly catastrophic situation. <laughs> if you want to really understand what that was all about, read a book by Reg Morrison, the very famous Australian photographer, uh, called Plague Species. It is one of the scariest books I've ever read, and you know, like, if you suffer de from depression, don't even look it up on Amazon. <laughs> Well, the world population more than trebled last century from uh, 1.8 billion to 6 billion, that's uh, in 2000, and since then has added a population the equivalent of the whole of America's merry little band of consumers. We're adding three humans per second, you know, so sort of <coughs> you, you, know, you can't stop it. Um, it, it's extraordinary. It's you know, 1,100 extras per hour that, that are crawling onto this. That's extra. That's not, you know, that's not, that's allowing for the people that died. And, um, and it's really ironical that we should be talking about this stuff in Australia, the continent where wildlife species had adapted their breeding cycles to respond to resource availability long ago, and where the indigenous human population had more or less reached a steady state with the environment over a period of about 60,000 years. So, you know, someone knew roughly how this business of sustainability could work, but we haven't listened to them. As an educator, I believe that humans can be trained to step back from this abyss which we're creating, but it will require a level of self-discipline and regulation that will take people to the edge of their genetic capabilities. We just love salty food. We just love fatty food. It's hardwired into the, the back, the old reptilian brain. And, and uh, whether we like it or not, you know, left brain working as hard as possible, be sensible, be sensible, still that damn thing is in there ticking away, sort of weakening us. <laughs> anyway, the population of Australia already exceeds its carrying capacity. It's perfectly clear any land capability assessment shows that we're trashing this country's natural resources and, and its life support systems and we're pillaging non-renewable resources from other countries, particularly phosphorus deposits. It really is time that we have this sustainable population discussion publicly in Australia. Dick Smith and Bob Carr have come out recently and hats off to them. Let's get on with it. Going back to a... Thank you. <laughs> I want to go back to a guy who's an absolute conservative, good old right-wing agricultural scientist, ex-chief of plant industry in the CSIRO, a guy called Lloyd Evans. He wrote a book, he's a brilliant historian as well, I might say, Feeding the 10 Billion. And he put a figure of 3 billion on the world population that could be sustained without the non-renewable resources of fossil fuels, essentially. How many we got now? 6.7 billion, okay? Who wants to leave now? You know, half of us have got to get off, if Lloyd's right. Now, Lloyd was around, and he wrote the book probably before a lot of the sustainable energy capture mechanisms were thought about, but I, I still think we're only talking three point something. So, you can say that Australia is a lucky country. We've been exporting food for 200 years. Surprise! Victoria is a net food importer, and Australia now spends more on imported food than it receives for food export. If anything caused a decline in food production, our population would rapidly lapse into food insecurity. This is now. Do you think anything could go wrong that might compromise our food production capacity? Keep listening. <laughs> Two years ago, we saw 25 countries restrict the export of strategic foods because they could see the world was in strife and they wanted to actually make sure their population didn't starve. Fair enough. So food security is inextricably linked with fossil fuels. Oil and gas virtually equals 
food. Okay. Through fertiliser, through transport, through food processing, etc. And supplies of readily available oil and gas will begin to decline rapidly over the next decade or, or two as the rigs have to go out to deeper and deeper water and more and more risky circumstances. So oil, for one, is going to be hard to get. Peak oil is with us. Now, you know, this is about you and, and, and how you behave. And of course, the food we eat has more impact on climate change than any other aspect of our lives, whether it be f through forest clearing or burning fossil fuels. The food choices we've made in the past we will be visited upon us in the future. In the lifetimes of you and your children, Adelaide can look forward to many more days above, above 45 degrees and some over 50 degrees. This will have a disastrous effect on our food production system. Let me just share with you what happens to a nice piece of fruit. Gay, you're lucky you don't live in bloody South Australia. <laughs> Temperature rises. It's hit 40 degrees centigrade. It's a completely clear day. There's no humidity in the air. The surface of that fruit is now 50 and it is starting to cook. The cells inside are starting to go mushy and the skin itself is starting to blister and burn. And that is what is going to happen to a lot of our fruit and veg over the next decade. Now, this is an ad for some of my friends out in uh, the, the agri-food industry who make plant sunscreen. And in fact, there's a plant sunscreen available. It's an SPF 45, very powerful, more powerful than the stuff that you put on yourself. And you can squirt it on your plants. So, you know, it's only calcium carbonate. But, you know, we're going to be forced to do this, not only bathe our children in potentially carcinogenic sunscreen, we'll also pop this stuff on our plants to survive. So we, we, we're now in the business of having to adapt very, very fast if we're going to have decent gardens. Well, that makes the winters warmer. Oh, that's nice. It's not nice because fruit trees require chill. They need to have a long period of low temperatures in order to reset all of their hormones that then tell the plant, springtime, flower, all together now, poof, and they all pollinate each other and we end up with fruit. But of course, if we have a warm winter, the poor little cells, these, they, they just don't know what's going on. Our flowering is not regular and we're getting flowers bursting at Christmas time instead of in September. And if you look at our pistachio crop at the food forest this year, it would be around about 5% of what we would normally have. Guess what? We had the warmest August on record last year. Now CSIRO reckons that um, rainfall is going to decline in southeastern Australia. Uh, but much more spectacular will be the runoff from our rivers. There, there won't be much. Um, and, and the Murray may well become unavailable for irrigation. Okay, you, you, you guys mainly br were brought up on citrus from the riverland, stone fruit from the riverland. Uh, it, it's going to be very, very hard to replace a productive area and a community and the expertise uh, that was enshrined up there. What else will happen? Goiter's line, that mythical line which separated the outside country, the, the pastoral kind of station country from the inside country, the agricultural country, where suddenly people wore tractor caps instead of broad brim braziers hats. <laughs> and uh, well, Goiter's line is actually rushing towards us. It's coming down from the north and uh, this will, might upset the vegetarians, but it's going to be the place to grow kangaroos and fat-tailed sheep from desert environments, and they will taste great. Um, <laughs> but it will, we will say farewell to a fair bit of Australia's food bowl, you know, the, the big wheat-growing areas in South Australia. It's on the way. 